likes this a whole lot better. So we need to be better at more of this and less of this. Because less you is more. Less I get more. more with less. <laughs> yes, I do. That's always a joke around here, trust me. Um, the other thing that Les does for me is I have a book and he writes poetry in it. So at various times I will find stuff that he's wrote in my book. Uh, and that's just his way of communicating to me. Uh, music is essential. A lot of times soft, relaxing music. Um, KY has some amazing massage oil. I encourage you to try it out. Um, Les is very good about sending me cards and leaving me little notes. Like this card says, lucky how I wake up every single day thanks to you. So, um, these can be amazing in responsiveness, trust me. Um, so those are just some of the things that... that and, and actually, it's a, it's a segue into the, into the next, the fourth item, which is the importance of romance. Because this all, this all kind of packages together. And guys aren't the, oftentimes aren't the best about being romantic. Uh, romance creates a setting for good sex. Romance has the potential to draw us into a world that belongs only to the two of us, which is when we go to a bed and breakfast in your ray, that's why we go there. We know that my cell phone doesn't work there, her cell phone doesn't work there, we can just spend the time doing what, what we want to do. Romance is the bridge between the everyday world of practicality and the private place of our sexual relationship. Uh, romance is the antidote to sex becoming um, more than mechanical and routine. And that can happen, I mean, very easily. If, if you have kids and all the things that life brings your way, it can get that way. We can create romance for one another. Then this need not is not to be complicated or involve great expense. I mean, a lot of the things that we do aren't very hard and they don't cost a lot. So, um, whether it's a picnic in the park, a walk down on the river, whatever it may be, uh, taking an afternoon off, going home for lunch, uh, whatever it takes. So, uh, these create the setting for lovemaking that involves every part of our being and draws us together physically, emotionally. Um, it creates that intimacy that, that really is key um, in our relationships. Uh, because typically women think more about romance than men. It's good when we as husbands discover what our wife considers to be romantic. Guys, ask. Again, just ask. It's one of those where you don't have to feel embarrassed to ask about what's going on. Um, and, your, then, and then create the right setting. At your table is a CD that's yours to take home and listen to. It was one of Jake's messages on rediscovering romance. Incredible. From a very young man who hasn't been married for a very long time, he gets it. This is an incredible message. And also, you guys are to take your bookmarks home and your door hanger. We love our door hanger. Our kids always know if this is on the door, they just don't come to the door. Well, for one thing, it's going to be a little tough because we're not going to give them keys to the house. So, Yeah, we always able, threatened when they left in. we were going to change the locks because <clears throat> they still have keys and they come in the house at any time they might be stopping by or whatever. And we're like, okay, your own risk. You might walk in and see something you don't want to see. So you might want to walk, knock be, or ring the doorbell. Might be scarred for life. I know, scarred for life. So um, we're going to talk next. Number five is the importance of anticipation. Our mind is, uh, is most important. Our mind is our most important sexual resource because anticipation builds desire. It's good to develop our own language and signals, which indicate to each other our desire to make love later that day. Anticipation is especially arousing for men. And we've talked about some of the ways that you can do that. Okay. Guys, one of the areas that we really need to watch, um, and that's the area of pornography. Um, most men will at some time have been exposed to pornography, either, either at school or at work, or um, most recently through the internet. Um, it's highly addictive. It promises freedom to explore a new, new and exciting world, but leads people to feeling trapped and disgusted. Um, and it spoils sexual intimacy. <coughs> this was an area... Two years ago at, our, at, our, at our, uh, our marriage retreat, 
uh, one of the guys that was in a breakout session for men was a pro officer. And he talked about just for guys that were incarcer had been incarcerated, that this was probably one of the, the, the areas that led them down the path um, to whether it was you know, a heavy drug abuse or theft or whatever. When they did the study, that this was an area that, that was in all of their backgrounds. Um, so it is. It's, it's an area that, that really is, can, can, can just hook you in. Women are reduced to objects to arouse sexual desires and then to satisfy them. Sex becomes impersonal. And that's, that's the real issue with pornography. Sex without relationship distorts the real thing and removes God from the picture. So understand that it's, it's about our, our spouse. It's not about our, our own uh, fulfillment. And there's also a very good book over here. Um, a true story that a woman wrote of the road that she walked with her husband from his addiction to pornography and how they walked together out of that lifestyle. Um, and for guys, we can't help being aroused. I mean, that's the way God made us. I mean, there's a reason that God made us to be attracted to our wife. Um, but we need, to, we need to direct those thoughts and desires towards our wife, not towards other objects. So if, if you have any addictions to pornography, you know, I'd suggest that there's, there's tons of things you can do. Um, asking for God's forgiveness. You can find someone else to help walk the path with you that understands the damage that pornography can do. Um, you know, really find someone that can help you mentor through that. Again, also through the marriage mentoring program. Uh, ladies, we're going to talk a little bit about our husbands have what we call a visual Rolodex. Um, the two books that we had talked about earlier, again, that have a lot of this information we've talked about for men only and for women only. One of the things that Shanti talks about in there is that we must understand that this is how God made our husbands. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's how he made them. So who are we to slam that around in his face. That's just how he's made. So imagine what our sex life would be if God didn't create our husbands to be aroused by our bodies. It might be pretty boring. So we play an important role in helping them take control in this area. Because our husbands walk around and work in a world that's filled with immodesty, we can be his best ally. And I have a great example of this. Um, Les and I um, were at Old Chicago with our youngest, Kayla. And I am very, our youngest is very small and petite, but very big busted and cute little blonde thing. And so I am even more um, uh, alert in and in tune to all these little bodies walking around that look especially like hers. But unfortunately, theirs are all hanging out. So we walk into Old Chicago and we get ready to sit down. And we're going to sit down towards the back to where you could see out on the patio. And so it was nice because people were sitting on the patio. And so I had actually uh, gone to sit beside Kayla and Les was going to sit across from me so that he could have been looking out to the patio. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and he says, did you see the girl in that shirt? And I said, what girl in the shirt? So Kayla and I turned around and it went, oh my gosh. And I'm like, there okay. Was more, there was much more out than in. So. so my first response could have been, how dare you? What a jerk. Why would you look? You're just an idiot. But no, my response was, trade me places. I know how God made you, and so I don't want to tempt you. And I want you to not be having to look at that the whole time that we eat. <laughs> and not because... And I was all for it yeah. because... It yeah, what? And not, I would have really been in trouble later yeah. on. <laughs> but what I realize is that why... God made me to be his partner. I need to help him. I need to uh, shelter his eyes from all that's out there. And so he said to me, no, she sat down, her back's toward me, we're okay. And of course my daughter's just shaking her head going, oh my gosh, because she just has no tolerance for any of that kind of thing. And but, it, but it was really interesting too, the, 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 what 
three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we went out, uh, our, all of the couples that, that teach and, and help out, went, we went out for a beer after, after the marriage course. And, and we were down at the ale house, and, and it was like, oh, my, I was telling Greg, I'm like, man, it's like teeny bopper night in here. I said, I said, you know, I could really have some fun with this. I said, I think I should pick out about a half a dozen of these young women. And I could have, I could have been there, I could have been 90% of them, I could have been their dad. dad. And I'm like, you know, I should just go up to them and say, you know what, your dad wanted me to tell you that he doesn't appreciate what you're wearing. (laughs) But I thought better of that and didn't do that. So, I just want you ladies to understand that, that we can help our husbands. We can be their ally and their friend. Because it is everywhere. Everywhere we go, we see it. And so... Let's do our best to help them out in every one of those situations that we can. Um, For women, let's talk about pornography. For women, the biggest thing for women is fantasizing. Women's romance novels and soap operas. Huge. Paints a picture to us that is so unrealistic, it's unbelievable. But you know what? We fall for it. We think that's the way it really is and that's the way we want it to be. And so we can get sucked into that and we can make that be what we want our marriage to be. And that's not what God's designed for it to be. So one woman was infatuated by her teenage daughter's boyfriend who was into bodybuilding. The relationship was all in her mind, a fantasy. But it affected her relationship so much with her husband that she almost lost him as a result of it. So fantasizing is horrible. It's not an option. The New Testament tells us to discipline our minds. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think about such things. Philippians 4.8. Okay, the sixth item is the importance of variety. And when I talk about variety, guys, it's not about getting a 20-something... That's half your wife's age, or you thank know, you, honey. You you know doing some, something along along those particular lines, and I'll and I'll talk about really what what variety is. But familiarity often produces complacency and boredom. Um, this applies as much to relationship as it does to to things, whether it's you know phys- you know oh I like the new TV or I need a new Xbox or what whatever it may be. Complacency or dullness in our sex relationship makes us much more susceptible to the thought of an affair. And that's really, uh, when, we, when folks think about variety, that's typically the first thing that comes to mind was, is an affair. An affair offers something new and exciting. A sex relationship within marriage can continue with vitality, deepening passion, and freedom over a lifetime. It's not something that just, just goes away. Variety can enrich our sex relationship and keep it fresh and exciting. Um, and I want, when I'm talking about variety, this is what I'm talking about. Um, for example, we can vary the place that we make love. It doesn't, since we're empty nesters, it's like I said, it doesn't always have to take place in the bedroom. Uh, you can vary who takes the initiative, who, who starts, who, who, uh, who plans the evening. Um, we may be av- able to vary the time. Like I said, go home, at, go home for lunch. Don't go out, go home. Um, it's not always the last thing at night, not the most dynamic moment of the day for some of us when we're, not, when we're just totally wiped out. And Teresa knows this because my days start really early. I'm usually in the office by about 6.30. Um, so 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, I'm shutting down. I'm, that's, you know, that's the, having sex is one of the farthest things from my mind. Um, we can vary the atmosphere. Uh, the glare of a 100-watt bulb is not the most sensual light. It can make you feel like a beached whale. Candle, candle's much kinder. So, yeah. it's like I said, Teresa candle. likes candles. Uh, you can vary the routine. It's, it's always easy to get stuck in a rut and always, uh, you know, the same time, the same day, what it, whatever it may be. Uh, but you need to have permission from each other. Um, and, and everyone needs to be okay with, what, with what's taking place. Variety requires creativity and romance, and it will stimulate passion and stop sameness and boredom. Um, and one of the things for us... Um, a night or two away in a different surrounding. We love taking little mini vacations. Uh, like I say, it doesn't have to be a week, but just doing something along, along those particular lines. Um, we also need to learn that we have to slow down in order to drink in and enjoy each other. 
We need to give ourselves permission to be erotic, truly naked, and unashamed. Song of Songs talks about that. <clears throat> Playfulness in our sex life replenishes us. It feeds our soul. It's an important part of our spirituality. We've lost that in the sexual arena. Couples are struggling, and a part of it is they've lost the joy of just being together sexually and intimately. Playfulness throughout the day kind of looks like this. Little kitchen hugs, notes in the lunch, phone calls, emails, anything that's playful and loving. doesn't have to be sexual, but it's something that connects you. Scheduled and structured sex is necessary and good. And you know, we, we say this over and over, and people just laugh at us. Schedule sex on your calendar, especially if you have kids. One of the things that got us through a lot of our time of raising our three kids is scheduling sex. And I know it sounds funny, but there's nothing wrong with it. And in fact, it can be some of the greatest time you have together because it's something you've planned, you're excited about, you're getting that, ready for. It's that anticipation. anticipation. <laughs> so um, we need to take time with our spouse Couples will end up with a far better sex life because they've learned to make love. That's the point, not just having sex. Great sex becomes secondary. It's not the goal. When you truly learn to tune into God, you're going to tune into each other, and you end up with a great sex life. Honest and open communication is vital, and we talked about that earlier. Okay. So, that's probably your phone. Uh, it is. Just ignore it. So it's exercise time, and it's also dessert time, and dessert is in the back, so I know that some of you were... were and were the whipped cream dessert. is for the angel food cake. <laughs> so okay. when we talk about exercise... And we put the chocolate syrup back in the fridge. It's on her purse, Candace. Uh, this is going to take you a little while to do. There's actually three, set, three sections... Um, to, uh -huh. in, in this particular exercise. So you're going to, each one of you is going to do section, each section individually. And then, as we, as we tend to always do, then you can go ahead and exchange books. So you've got about 30 minutes. So around 8.30, we will we'll come back to wrap up. And, and we're actually, we're, we're like right on schedule. Like this is the first time um, that I think we've ever been like right on schedule. So... Okay, um, the homework this week enables you to follow up on what we've talked about. It's entirely practical, so um, there's, it's, it's only like a one-page deal in there. So, Plan times of making love. Hmm, good exercise. They, so, so this week you don't have an excuse. It's actual homework in your book. <laughs> and you remember we told you that, that this course was written by um, a British couple. And they said one couple were traveling up to Scotland the day after the session and planned to do their homework on the plane until they turned over and saw what it involved. So I'm, I'm thinking that that didn't happen. So um, Our sex relationship is such an important part, but it's like we talked about tonight, it's not easy. I mean, it's, if, if, it was, if it was easy, uh, there wouldn't be things like people wouldn't be having affairs. Um, you know, we wouldn't have, and it wouldn't be just one of those big areas uh, in our marriages. A British sociologist studying faithfulness in marriage wrote, My research shows that fewer than half of the men and women who were married in the 70s remained faithful after 10 years of marriage. <coughs> and after two years, the most common disillusionment have set, has set in lack of sexual fulfillment. <coughs> so we know it's a, it's a huge area. An affair destroys a trust between a husband and wife and causes such hurt. Those statistics represent many broken marriages and families that are destroyed that have left many regretting um, what, what's taken place. And we know that just how commonplace aff affairs are um, even in the church. Um, and we know that, that um, it's interesting, that's one of the big things that we're dealing with right now on the marriage mentoring side are just a phenomenal number of affairs uh, that have taken place and, and that's, that's the real big thing that, that, that's, that, that's really taking place. None of us ex is exempt from the danger of an affair. Catherine, uh, a married woman who felt herself being drawn towards a relationship with another man, speaks of her experiences. She was taken by surprise by the suddenness and strength of her emotions. 
Because the attraction was not sexual, it felt pure and good to her, at least initially. She had been married for seven years and found herself strongly attracted to Rob, a colleague at work. She struggled privately with her feelings for six weeks. Then one evening, she went out with a group from work, including Rob. After a few drinks, she found herself telling him of her feelings. He was keen to pursue the relationship. For Catherine, the draw was a sense of closeness to a man who listened to her and seemed to understand her. His desire was for a sexual relationship with a woman that he found attractive. Catherine said there were two realizations that saved her from starting an affair. The first came through a book on marriage, <coughs> excuse me, which enabled her to distinguish between the initial attraction for which she was not responsible and the choice to pursue those thoughts for which she was. The second realization was that she was not strong enough to deal with the temptation on her own. As a result, she confided in an older woman whom she could trust, seeking her support and advice. Having poured out her inner turmoil, she felt no longer alone in the struggle and could see the issues much more clearly. And I think that that's one of the, the, the big things. What we recommend to folks is that if, you, if you're in that, in that particular setting, number one, you've got to remove yourself, but be with someone else. Talk with someone else about it. Someone, um, whether it's an older couple or an older man or an older woman who, who may have uh, just know exactly what, what you need to do in order to take yourself out of the situation. Catherine was determined to put boundaries in place to avoid being unfaithful. As her work forced her together with Rob, she was prepared to change jobs if necessary, although as it happened, he was transferred to another office. Meanwhile, as she had kept these thoughts secret from her husband, Simon, a distance had grown between them. He had felt her shutting down deep communication without knowing why. Having started to take action to prevent an affair, Catherine felt able to tell him the reason for the change. She <coughs> excuse me, then asked for his forgiveness. Since bringing it out in the open, Catherine was determined to focus on her thoughts, on her husband, and all that is good about their marriage. Simon has taken more care to listen to her and to encourage and affirm her. Not only has their marriage been saved, but they've grown closer as a result of the near crisis. And I know that there are times when many of us may, may get to that particular uh, place, but it's, when that happens, we need to be able to recognize the, the, the signs. And one of the things that I always tell people, the illustration that I give, is if you're, if you're standing at the edge of the cliff, you're already well, well beyond where your boundaries should be. You need to set your boundaries so far back that when you see the edge of the cliff out there, that you know that you're getting too close. And so just know exactly where those boundaries are at and follow those boundaries. Now I'm just going to talk really shortly uh, before we end about how we affair proof a marriage. The first thing we need to do is continually build each other up. Affairs are usually the result of a failure to meet each other's emotional needs for encouragement, for attention, and for affection. And one of the ways that we do that is... Um, through email. Les and I communicate through email and it's only a safe place for us. It's a place that uh, we know when we get an email it's something good. And believe me, you can even communicate in email when it has to do with your sexual life. And I'm not going to read you anything pornographic, but I'm just going to read you one of the emails that I sent him. I don't write anything pornographic. No. So. <laughs> I said, hello sweetheart, just wanted to let you know how much I enjoyed our <laughs> evening last night. It was a wow night. Thank you for being such an incredible lover and finding ways to make me feel special and loved. It was so awesome to be able to pray with you when we were just laying there together in each other's arms. How safe, protected, loved, and secure I felt with you by my side. God is so good. Have a great day, and I look forward to seeing your smiling face tonight. With all my love and respect, Teresa. So, you know, we ta talked about the three things, protected, loved, and secured, and she actually included all three of those in an email, so... So those are the kind of things that we can do to build each other up. And for him, words of affirmation is his love language. So I just nail it when I do that with him. The second thing is set boundaries. Les talked about that. That was the book that we gave out last week when you <coughs> talked about in-laws, boundaries in your marriage. Infidelity starts or stops in our mind. We can't help ourselves being attracted to people, but we can decide whether to control such thoughts. Jesus' words offer the best protection. Out of Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
As one man put it, the difference between simply looking at a woman and looking at her lustfully is about five seconds. So that's where I talked about our trip at Old Chicago. You know, don't let him have the opportunities that the enemy would love to present. Many affairs begin not with immediate sexual attraction, but through intimate conversation. Let's just read the story about the lady. There was no sexual attraction there. It was somebody was listening to her and communicating and meeting the deepest needs. And her husband wasn't doing that. Set a boundary.